Hey everybody, I'm Amanda with DevExpress and welcome to today's webinar, DevExpress MVC Extensions Getting Started, presented by DevExpress Technical Evangelist, Paul Usher. In this webinar, see how to use the DevExpress Template Wizard to kickstart your project, get the most from the scaffolding wizard to save time in coding, set up and configure critical elements of a data-driven site, including data grids, editors, and themes. Thank you for joining us. I will now hand things over to Paul Usher. Thank you, Amanda, and good morning to everyone. Getting started with DevExpress ASP.NET MVC extensions. That's quite a mouthful. What I'm going to do as we go through the presentation is just refer to ASP.NET MVC as MVC. Now, I don't want to get that mixed up with the programming practice of MVC, which, of course, has been around a lot longer than ASP.NET MVC. In fact, so much so, it was before what most of us know as the internet. Now, what is ASP.NET MVC and how do I move from being a WinForms or WebForms developer into this technology that everybody is talking about? To take a look, we'll step back in time. Wait for we'll go to webinar to catch up. And we're going to go all the way back to 1998, which is when classic ASP was released. And what that brought us was VB on the web. We could create websites that included HTML markup and code all included in the one file. It allowed us to deliver dynamic websites. The thing was, if we wanted to do anything on the client side, we'd have to create ActiveX controls or Java applets. If we wanted to do something on the server side, we had to create COM-based controls. And I'm sure that there's some people out there that can remember some of the issues relating to that. Templating was available by the use of things like the hash include uh, attribute. Now let's fast forward a few years. Because after 1998, but before 2002, the .NET Framework was released. And in 2002, we were given Windows Forms on the web, or ASP.NET as we know it. Now this gave us a separated view. It gave us the HTML or markup in one file and our code in another. It also delivered some cool features. All of a sudden, we had event-driven mechanisms. We could create server-side controls. We had data binding available. This thing called state management, and of course, a visual designer where we could drag and drop controls. Now, what we're using today in ASP.NET Web Forms is still based on that original set of principles. Let's go forward a few more years to 2007 and ASP.NET MVC was put into Client Technology Preview, or CTP. And this started delivering even more for web developers. It gave us a true code separation model, where our views and our controllers and our models were all in separate files, not some partial class type hierarchy as we'd seen previously. It provided a shorter pipeline and shorter page lifecycle or smaller page lifecycle. It included the really important aspect that we can do complete unit tests on code. And as developers, it gave us full control over that HTML output. It came with a smaller footprint, and it started to include things such as Web API, which of course is important for delivering things like JSON data or other packages into web services or even into our websites themselves. We saw the introduction of NuGet and the whole package management system, which meant it easier to maintain and manage different versions across different projects. The whole framework was extensible, and over time, we started to see additional modules being added. One of the most important aspects is it gave us configuration, sorry, convention over configuration. And we'll see how important convention is as we start looking at MVC projects. From that first CTP back in December 2007, 
the team steadily released new versions every year. We're now looking at version 6, which is in preview at the moment. And each release, they delivered more. More functionality, easier ways to do things. They delivered scaffolding and templating. So MVC has been around now for seven plus years, and it's here to stay. And it's a great model to work with. As with any technology, there are some drawbacks. So I decided to ask some developers what their biggest concerns were across the two technologies. When it came to AS the conventional ASP.NET, the big things were view state and page lifecycle, which we'll take a look at in a second. For the MVC guys, there were things like the initial cost of the first page load, particularly the inclusion of script files. The fact that there was a separate pipeline for MVC and Web API. That's something that's been addressed in version 6, however. And then depending on the background of the developer, the no designer became a problem. Now out of everything, I think the no designer aspect is the biggest mental hurdle for a web developer or a web forms or WinForms developer to get over. There will not be a designer for MVC. There doesn't need to be because at the end of the day we're working in code and markup. It does mean in some respects your fingers are going to do more walking, but with the adaption of the wizards and the scaffolding and the templating, a lot of that code is pre-written for you. I mentioned about the page lifecycle. What I've got here is a couple of slides that give you just a small indication as to what goes on in a traditional web forms page lifecycle. We can see that there's all sorts of things happening at the page level, master page level, user control, server control. You've got all sorts of events being bubbled. But that's not all because we've actually got another two additional slides on all the possible things that happen in a traditional web forms application. And I know certainly in my experience, there's been times where something has happened to my page, the results have been unexpected because of this huge behind the scenes happening of that page lifecycle. So how does that compare to the MVC page lifecycle? In a nutshell, it's that simple. The request comes in, the route determines what needs to be done, the controller takes over, works with the model to generate the view via your chosen view engine, and the response is pushed back down to the browser. Remember that this whole ASP.NET MVC principle is based on a disconnected model, and that is that you're not going to be receiving events back at the server. It keeps it clean, and it's certainly a lighter version or a more lightweight option for page development. I also mentioned view state before. Now, view state's obviously been in the web forms since the beginning. And it's important. When you're doing your round trip back to the server, you're going to need to tell the server, hey, this was happening at the time. I need it included on the new output you're about to render. Whilst it's important, it's a lot of bloat. There's a lot of extra traffic that is not necessary. Here we can see over 47K of encoded data making that server round trip. When compared to MVC, we're going to see the header information, in this case a small cookie, and then just the data that needs to go back and be processed by the server. When comparing the two frameworks, that gives us a little bit of background, but what about MVC itself? Well, let's take a look at what MVC is not. It is not a new way of doing everything. You're using the same HTML, you're using the same C-sharp syntax that you would be using in your existing applications. And when I say C-sharp, it could mean C-sharp or VB. It's certainly not too complex to learn in time for your next project. In fact, especially with the latest versions of Visual Studio and the .NET Framework, you can run your web forms application at the same time as MVC in the same project. And so it's my recommendation that you start saying, I want to use MVC, 
any new page I create in my existing legacy application will be MVC. Any of my old pages that I touch, I'll migrate to MVC. It's not a one or the other choice. You can work together. And MVC is definitely not designed to make your life more complicated. There's a feeling out there in the community sometimes that frameworks are introduced, they're over-architected and just become too big or too complicated. That is not the MVC way. In fact, MVC is a great way to keep your code, to keep your markup and your control flow in an organized fashion. MVC is easy to learn because there's no new syntax and things that you're going through. And it's definitely designed to help you build and maintain better software. We keep throwing this term MVC or model view controller around. What does that actually mean? Simply put, a view is something that the user is going to see. So the end resulting web page, HTML generated for the browser. The user will interact in some cases with that and a request is sent back to the server. That's handled by the controller, the controller with the model, everything gets manipulated, which in turn updates the view. The result, the user is now presented with a new page to look at, whether it be small changes or an entire new page. That's the principle of MVC. The model, the controller and the view are separate entities. The view doesn't need to know anything about the controller. There's also something we need to be careful of. We don't want to end up with fat controllers. You see, the model should be where all our business logic and data handling is put. The controller should be a thin controller and the view should be thought about as a dumb view. So what is a model? Well, the model represents the data that we're working with. And we're not talking just about a database bound set of values. The model can bring data in from multiple places. It could be bound directly to a backend database. You could actually have your model go off and retrieve data from a web service or some other backend service. And you can do cool things inside your model such as if you're bringing data from a database, you might create some read-only properties expressing full names or addresses that you want to display. And models are also known as entities, POCOs, which is plain old CLR objects, object classes, or other collective names. That brings us to what is a view. Now, view is used to render the user interface. You don't have to use the Razor syntax. In fact, the way that the view engine is built, you can implement your own complete rendering system. On screen, we're looking at an example of some Razor, and we can see how we've got standard HTML markup. I've got some header tags in there. And then we've got this at symbol followed by a property which is coming from the model. So the view interacts with the model and can bring forth any of those elements. And we're going to spend a few minutes inside Razor shortly. Then we have the controller. And the controller is the interaction uh, with the model based on things such as what's passed into the header and the HTTP verbs. It determines whether it's going to be responding with a get or a post or a put. And the routes tell MVC where to go. In short, your browser sends a request through. The controller determines what needs to be done and works with the model to create the view model or the view. That view is pushed back to the browser, remembering that we're talking disconnected. The code that is pushed to the browser is HTML and we're not talking about binding anything at the server side. So how does all that look in practice? I'm going to switch over to Visual Studio and take you through a couple of things. Now, one thing when you're dealing with MVC projects, there are a lot of packages to be brought in. So Visual Studio will sometimes sit there, maybe for you know, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, it just depends what it's doing. So if you see me switching between different instances of Visual Studio, it's purely to save you the time watching or waiting for my machine. 
But if we would start with a blank instance of Visual Studio, I could come along and do File, New Project. When the New Project Wizard is shown, I choose an ASP.NET web application. Now I'm going to come back to the Dev Express template gallery a little later on. I'm going to give this a name of blank project, new project, and click OK. Next I'm presented with the new project wizard. And as I showed or mentioned before, we can incorporate more than just one project type into the solution. I can choose MVC, I could also choose Web API and incorporate web forms all in the same project if I wanted to. I can add my unit testing with a simple click of a mouse. Now for simplicity, I'm just going to go with MVC and I'm going to change the authentication to none so that we reduce some of the folders that are going to get created. And what we'll end up with is this blank solution template solution. We can see that there is a number of folders preset. We've got our app start folder, which has some config files. We'll come and look at those in just a second. I've got my content folder, which contains things in this case, my bootstrap templates and CSS. Now, I mentioned earlier as well that convention was very important when it came to MVC. These folders are an important aspect of that. We've got this folder called controllers, we've got a folder called models, and we've got a folder called views, hence MVC. If I just have a look at what's inside my views folder, we can see that I have a home folder by default, a shared folder, and then we've got this strange extension CSHTML. We'll start by taking a look at the home controller. What we'll do first is just run that into the browser. So I'll start without debugging. And once Cassini or II Express runs up in the background, we're going to see our very first MVC application. I've not changed any of the code that's been generated here by that Microsoft wizard. We can see that we've got a nice menu structure. And as I move my mouse over each of these, in the bottom left-hand corner, we can see that the URL is going to change. So we've got our home, we've got our about, which is slash home slash about, and contact, which is slash home slash contact. It's important to understand the principle of this URL naming convention. Back into Visual Studio and open the home controller file. Any time you create a new controller, and we'll do one together in a second, it needs to have the name of controller after it. See, under the hood, the MVC framework is going to be doing some stuff by reflection. So it will try and match views and other things. You'll often see inside a controller an action result. Now, index happens to be the default property or return for this controller. And you can see here that it's going to return this thing called view. We've also got one for about, which returns view. And we've got one for contact, which returns view. Now, if I was to come down here and type in public action result breaks and have that return a view as well, we'll see what happens. In these examples above, we've got this thing called view bag. Now, view bag is a dynamic collection or dynamic data dictionary that allows you to pass information between the controller and the model, and therefore the model and the view. We don't need to worry about what's going on at this point. I'm just going to save and run that again and see what happens. So our controller now has this option. If we go home about, we're going to see the about page. What's going to happen when I actually tell it that I want to view the home slash breaks? Well, the controller itself knows about this, but we're going to get a server error. And this error actually gives us a lot of information. It tells us that the controller is looking for a view called breaks. And in fact, it shows us quite clearly the order in which it's looking through the project for that. It's going to start at the home folder. 
if it doesn't find it there in either ASPX or ASCX, it's going to look at the shared folder. If it doesn't find it there, it's going to go back and look for the CSHML or VBHTML version and then go to the shared folder again. So the controller is aware of this new thing that I want to use, but there's nothing there to work with it. One of the nice things with the scaffolding and templating is that I can come into my action result, it knows it's looking for a view, and I can bring up the context menu. I'm going to choose Add View, and I get this little dialog appear. My view name needs to be Breaks because that's what it's expecting, and I can choose from a template. So straight out of the box, I can select whether I want to create, delete, or edit, so your basic CRUD functionality, template, whether I want an empty, with or without a model, or a list. I'm going to keep it simple and choose empty without model. We can see now the scaffolding going to work in the background. If we look down into the project folder, it's now created this file called breaks.cshtml. And this pre presents me with just some markup. You'll notice that in the syntax highlighting, we've got this at symbol, which is marked in yellow, and then some C sharp code. I'm going to come back to that in just a second and have a look at what is involved or how Razor and C sharp syntax can work together. If I go back to this page and now just hit refresh, instead of having a server error application, we're expecting to see the word index or breaks because that's what was in the markup. So straight away by adding the view, our project now works. Let's just spend a couple of minutes looking at Razor syntax. Typically we are working with just HTML. We can see that I have a head to tag in there and if I went, I could say no longer breaks. But how does this help if I'm writing other markup? Well, inside your Razor file or your markup file, you can do some pretty cool things. I can start typing some plain text, which is going to get rendered just as HTML. And I'm going to say you are using, and I want to know what type of browser you're using. By using the at symbol, I'm invoking C sharp syntax. And I can do inline, like I'm doing here, or I could do a collection, like you can see above, using the curly braces. Now I know that there is a thing called request and you can see that the IntelliSense is popping up here showing me that hey, you're using c -sharp syntax, I've got some options for you. So I'm going to do request, I'm going to do browser. Now the browser option ret returns a great deal of information, so I just want to know your browser. The other thing I can do, or one of the things you can realize is, the compiler knows that the at symbol is c -sharp code. So what would happen if I want to include an email address? I'm going to say email me and put my email address in here. Straight away the syntax has turned yellow. If I put devexpress.com, it's now gone back and recognized that that is just markup. One of the things that does break it, however, is if I put my Twitter handle in here, it's going to give me a compiler error. And to get around that, I can simply use a double at sign so that it's happy. If I just render this quickly to that browser, close some of these other windows while we wait for it, we're going to see that that page renders, the HTML comes forward, no longer breaks, I'm using Chrome, email me, and Twitter. So I get that combination of everything that's happening in the background there. What about bringing in some useful information? Well, one of the things we can do is create these little helper methods. So I'm going to use at helper and I'm going to create something called format values. My format values method is going to receive a decimal of, uh, let's change it to amount, spell it correctly, and then start typing some code. So inside my helper method now, I'm going to create a new var called color, and we're going to change that to green, that way we can see something happening. Again, just using c -sharp syntax, I'm going to say if amount is less than zero, then set color to red. 
So far, so good. I'm just using some basic principles. I'm still inside this helper class, but now I want it to do something on my page. I want it to return a span, and this span is going to have a style. Inside here, we're going to say we want to set the color property to at color. And you can see straight away that the IntelliSense has picked up. I've got a local variable called color. So I'm going to accept that. Inside my span, I want to return a string.format. And my string format is going to have a parameter formatted as currency. And we're going to treat that as the word amount. So this would be a helper method that I can now call anywhere inside my markup. What we'll do quickly, just to see this in play, is add another little bit of C sharp, and we're going to say, I want a new list of decimals, so we'll give it some values. So at this point, I might call this amounts, and that's going to equal a new, not a new parser, but a new list of decimal, and inside this list of decimal, I'm going to put some initial values. So let's go with 100, 50, minus 40, and if we wanted to use non-integer numbers, I'd need to just make sure that they were received correctly. I need to finish my line by putting the semicolon in, and we now have created a variable that's available anywhere inside my markup. We've seen that we can use some C-sharp syntax there, and we can use some markup inside our C-sharp method. But let's switch it around the other way. Let's do an, unord an unordered list, and let's do a for loop, so for each decimal, and we'll call this one value in amounts. And inside this loop, I'm going to do a list item, and I'm going to say call my helper method format values, and pass in the value. If I quickly just run this now, what we're expecting to see is those items from my list returned to the screen pre-formatted depending on the amount. So we can see that we have $150 in green, our negative number in red, and then another positive number. So it's a really nice way of being able to combine c -sharp syntax and other markup. Now one of the things that happens is you might want some plain text. Well, we're inside a code block here, so if I type in some plain text such as your value, what's going to happen? The compiler is going to complain. It's going to say, well, I don't know what this plain text is. So you can deal with that in two ways. You can come through and insert a text block and just place your value inside the text block, or you could come through and use the at colon to do some plain text. So if I now refresh this page here, what we should see is our plain text coming through. Nothing special, nothing scary, it is just what you've been used to using. It's C-sharp code and it's standard markup. It's just combining the two together for what you want to do. Save all this and head back to our slides. So now we've created an MVC project. We've had a bit of a look at the, the whole controller and how that interacts with the, the view itself. We've taken a look at the Razor syntax. So where does DevExpress fit in with this new, well not new, but this growing technology? For those that are aware of, of what we do here at DevExpress, we're in the UI game. We help you create stunning interfaces. For us, it's all about the end user elements, whether it be editors or grids or charts. That's the game that we, we're working with. The goal is to help developers become productive by not having to spend time writing complex UIs. We provide the frameworks and things for you. And that's exactly what we've done with our MVC extensions. Now, a couple of things I want to mention here. Our extensions have written from the ground up. They're not wrappers around other technologies. 
and we've got extensions covering just about every scenario from a visual aspect that you can think of. We're going to take a look at the grid view in just a moment, but we've got the grid view, we've got the report viewing tools, we've got our visualization libraries being charts and gauges and a whole host of other business intelligence visualization options. We've got a complete spreadsheet control that within a few lines of code you can create a very powerful Excel styled spreadsheet handler all in MVC. We've got our pivot grids, we've got the navigation and layout suite where you can design, give the user the ability to have resizable windows and panels and docks and floats. We've got our scheduling component if you wanted to create a diary type system or do some kind of project scheduling. We've got the HTML editor, the tree list, We've got a complete suite of data editors, text boxes, radio buttons, everything all generated as MVC extensions. You just get to set the properties on what you want to do. So how does that work inside an application? Well, there's two, two things to consider here. One might be that you've got an existing application and here's my template that was created with the Microsoft wizard. And if I wanted to, I could do one of two things to bring this into the world of DevExpress. I can click on the DevExpress menu and I could come down to the ASP.NET controls and say run wizard to update project. That would go through and bring up a new dialogue which allows me to do things like setting the theme that I want to apply. I could come through and change some of my site configuration and add some localization if it's imperative to my project. But effectively what this wizard would do is go through and add all the dependencies into the project that you'd be required to run for including our controls. The other thing you can do and something you do regularly inside your project would be the context menu and choosing the insert DevExpress MVC extension. When I invoke this, we're going to see a wizard appear which gives me some options. In fact, it allows me to work through any MVC extension that we provide. We can see across the top, the wizard is broken down into different areas. So I've got common, data, navigation and layout, reporting, scheduling and visualization. Then the left hand side, as I click through, I get the choice of what type of control I might want to insert. And with every control, there's an option for changing the extension name, I can do the binding as to locking it into a model and there's usually additional panels. The one that I'm interested in today is going to be the grid view. But before we can add a grid view control into our project, we need to talk about models. To do that, I'm going to switch over to another template that I created called the DXMVC. Now just like we saw in the Microsoft one, we've got all the folders, we've got a controller folder, model and view. The only thing inside this controller is the index action and if I was to look at the markup, I've simply got some basic properties there. So if I was to run that, we're not going to see anything exciting other than the word home. Now we talked about models a little bit earlier and that they can come from anywhere. So I could create just a straight class, add some properties onto it and use it inside my view. But what I want to do is actually add some data from a database. So I'm going to choose new item and then from the pop-up I'm going to go up to the data and select the ADO entity data model. Obviously at this point you could choose whatever is required for your project. I'm going to create this and call it books and then choose the entity framework designer from the database. Here I'm going to need to start a new connection and I want to point to my local instance of SQL. So we just wait for that dialog to pop up and say SQL Express and then my database name is going to be my library. Now this is just a small database that I tend to use when presenting it contains one table which is a collection of books. So again we'll wait for the wizard, select the books table and finish. 
one important step after I've added the model is going to be a rebuild. And that's because, some, because of some of the reflection that's used to allow the framework to know what's going on. So we'll just wait for the entity framework or EDM file to get added and we can move forward. Just while this is happening, wondering if there are any early questions, team, that I need to address. Hey, Paul. Um, are you using Visual Studio 2013 Professional or Ultimate? Uh, I'm sure. using... That's a great question. I don't know. I'm using <laughs> Visual Studio Professional. First time I've ever been asked that, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> so now I've got my EDMX file sitting in here. I'm going to do my rebuild and everything should be good. So inside my models folder is just my entity item. What I'm going to do is come down into my markup file. I'm going to right click. I'm going to say I want to insert a DevExpress MVC extension. We're going to see in a second the little wizard appear. And just as we did before, I'm going to be able to step through and select the extension I want. So here I want grid view. I'm going to leave the extension name as grid view and the partial name as, as grid view. Now I didn't talk about partial views before, but effectively inside your markup, you can call partial views. Think of those more as user controls in other technologies. Now that you can call a partial view, you can also call a render partial view, which will update just one part of the page. And obviously, if you think about some of the tools that we're looking at now with these extensions, there's a lot of visual thing going on. So behind the scenes, uh, the grid extension, for example, will use callbacks to update data at the server level and then refresh what needs to be refreshed. It is using that separated model though. We've got the grid view. I'm going to choose the models book from my model class so we can see if I hadn't have done the rebuild it wouldn't show. And inside my data context class I'm going to choose the library entities. Now I get to select what columns I want to include inside my grid. Now at the end of the day this wizard is going to be generating code for me. So anything that it builds I can update in my markup if I need to. And we'll take a look at that in just one second. From the key field, I'm going to choose ID. Obviously, if I'm looking at working back to the database, saving or updating, I need to have that information. And then there's some other properties which I'll just leave on. Now we're going to see the wizard in the background going through and adding some things to the view. As far as the view itself goes, all we're going to see is this at HTML tag action grid partial view which obviously is pointing to this view called grid partial view. And the naming convention with partial views is to use the underscore in front. If I look at the code inside the partial view, we can see that we've got our C sharp block and it's instantiating the grid view, which has got some properties being set up in the initializer, being these settings. We can see that inside this code, we've got some new routes being added, one for adding records, one for updating records, and one for deleting records. And they're being told to go back to the home controller and look at each individual action. So if I was to jump back to my home controller file here, we can see that that scaffolding and template wizard has generated the necessary actions. Here was my original index, or my action result for index, and then we can see that the model's been instantiated. And we can see that under action review grid partial, it gets told what it needs to do. And for each of those action results, so there's the add, there's the update, and there's the delete, we can see that the code has been generated for us. We don't need to worry too much about what's going on. Come back to my partial view. We can see that there's some, or first of all, we're going to get a confirmation if we try and delete a row. And there's some other settings. We're going to see a command column with a new delete and edit button. As we scroll down, we can see the inclusion of those columns. So if I wanted to add or remove a column, I can just do that now in the markup. 
If we actually run this, let's take a look at what gets displayed. Just wait for it to render onto the browser. I'll tidy up these other tabs. The first thing we're going to notice when the page renders is the grid view itself in its complete elegance. It's going to be showing me all the data from my library's collection. Now, you may or may not be familiar with our ASP.NET web forms or AJAX control being the grid view. This performs the same functionality, but again, it's that MVC extension. I can come in here and straight away, I could do things like sort my records, or I could do searches. So very, very powerful things. We're dealing at client side here. I can come through and I could edit information. Now, one thing I need to just check here is make sure that one of the other background ones aren't running, which is fine. One of the things that we'll see, I'm going to rerun this, back to close my browser and run this again. Wait for it to render. And maybe jump back to Visual Studio while it does that so we're not sitting waiting. Coming back to this markup and the different options I have inside my grid. By default, I'm just adding the default properties. So I'm saying, hey, here's a field name, discontinued. Here's the field name, price. What we're not going to see on the grid, and we've got a small caching issue happening, is the formatting itself. So stop and run inside Internet Explorer and go. What I'm wanting to show you, and it's just a case issue with Chrome at the moment, by default, this information, the price column or the discontinued field would just be raw data, the same as it is everywhere else. So if I want to actually do some formatting on it, I can come back into Visual Studio and I've got other properties or extensions that I can do on these columns. That's fine. If I want to choose price and I wanted to actually format the price column, I can actually just say price, so the column number, and then I'm going to say properties edit dot display format. And inside the display format, I'm going to say I want you to be a currency field. If I wanted to actually change the type of column that gets rendered on the discontinued column, by default it would just be a raw text field saying true or false. What I can do is overload the add column method and I could say here that I want MVC uh, X grid column type and that I actually want that as a checked box. So that when the grid renders you'll see what we were showing before which is this check box instead of just raw text. So there's lots of ways that you can extend that model. Exactly the same thing could be applied for any other control if I was to use the insert dialog. You're going to see the HTML or the C-sharp code get generated ready for you to use. I mentioned early on about the fact that there's no visual designer. Working inside views like this is not a, an arduous task. In fact, it, when you get start playing with the markup, it's easier than trying to switch between a design view and a source view and waiting for things to, to render. So much so that you can leave your application running and just keep hitting refresh in the browser to see your changes, which is going to give you a more realistic view as to what your end users are going to see as opposed to what you have in your project. A couple of other settings that I might use as, as common things inside my grid would be settings.settings show filter button, show filter, show header filter button pull, equals true, and that would turn on my Excel style filtering. It may be that I want to incorporate a total in my footer, so I could come along and do settings, and of course all this is 
built into IntelliSense. So it's going to help me along the way with everything I do. Here I want my total summary. I might say I want to add a new total summary. And at this point I'm going to use a Dev Express data summary item type. And I'd have access to saying whether I want average count, max min, or a custom summary type. I might choose I want count and I want that to be returned from my title field. One of the things that I often find when we work with any of these controls to learn what's going on is to look at the Dev Express demos page or even the demos application that ships with not Dev Extreme but the demo center that ships with our controls. There are so many different examples. We, uh, in everything we do, we provide the markup. We show you how to use the controller. So here, if I just spin up the MVC demos, we can see what's involved in actually running the spreadsheet control inside our MVC application. I think it might be quicker to go to the DevExpress website. Let's see. So if I wanted to look at the document management functionality or how to incorporate a spreadsheet inside my next MVC project, I can come through, I can see and interact in real time with the control. So here we can see we've got the Excel style power that I was talking about before. But as, as I scroll down my page, it's going to show you all the markup that you would need to implement this. So this would be the controller code. It would show you what goes in the controller common code what goes behind the view. So every step of the way there's a help and functionality to assist. When we first set out with our MVC extensions we thought it would be a great practice to build an entire application. One that incorporated tests and all the other principles that we want or that people expect from MVC. What I'm about to show you is also shipped in source code format, so you've got full access to look at how this was put together and how you can incorporate some of these things into your project. Effectively, it's a clinical study diary. You choose who you are and log on. And then you're presented with this beautiful looking interface. All the assets, all the CSS, everything's there for you. You can switch between these pages. Gives it a look and feel like a real patient book. When I click on a patient, we're going to see all the different aspects of our MVC extensions in use. We've got the pop-up editors. We've got date controls. All the different things that I might want to look at in my study. It's a great starting point if you're just breaking into the MVC world. Okay, before I go into a uh, overload, Amanda, questions? Hey Paul, um, we have, well we've had a ton of questions come in, but as you know the team is behind the scenes, uh, Julianne, Mahul um, are answering questions, let's see if they haven't got to any. Um, we had a question from a tool, is this all going to work fine with Visual Studio 2010? That's a great question. I'm looking at, uh, at my support line right now, ready for somebody to answer. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I, I'm guilty of always wanting to use the latest IDE and the latest updates, which occasionally gets to uh, bite you on the proverbial. But um, I know that we sub definitely support multiple versions of Visual Studio with our, all our controls. I'm just wondering if there's any of the MVC framework that's not supported in VS 2010. So, have to find out, Amanda. Uh, the team looks like it's saying, yes, it does work with 2010, but Microsoft is, you know, decreasing their support of 2010, blah, blah, blah. Something to that effect. <laughs> So, so it's not. It's certainly not a limitation on our extensions. It's more relating to whether the latest MVC frameworks would be supported inside Visual Studio 2010. 
Um, <laughs> sorry, I just Tony said, can I use this with BB6? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there an advantage of using DevExpress MVC for mobile apps from Anup? Look, I always think it's a matter of choosing the right tool for the right job. Um, the MVC architecture is going to be a, and I know that some people hate me using the word lighter weight or uh, even that the phrase keep it light, but I think the MVC architecture is superior, don't shoot me everybody, to traditional web forms. And we went through some of those reasons why, so I would say yes. Uh, have you integrated AngularJS in the client side of the framework? I'm looking for an answer from Mahul or Don right now. When you say in the client side, there's there's nothing stopping you implementing your own controls or frameworks at the client side. Our extensions are server side based. Hey, can you hear me, Paul? I can hear you. Okay, sorry, um, I'm on the phone side. Uh, yes, what you said, and just to add to that, our JavaScript uh, controls widgets do support Angular and their directives. So absolutely but not ASP.NET. Uh, the thing to remember, and I think this also goes for the other gentleman who asked Anoop about PhoneGap and so forth, uh, it's like Paul said, you've got to use the right tool for the right job. And ASP.NET can serve mobile browsers, but not mobile apps. Apps are these little compile things that get running. So no, we, we give you reach with the web. The web is great for that. All the browsers, all the operating systems on the browsers, you want to reach, you can do that, but not as an app. If you want to package it up, put it in an app store, ASP.NET is not your technology because it's a server-side technology. And of course, if you are looking for the, the thing like Mahul's mentioning, we have Dev Extreme Mobile, which does have full support for Angular as well as the other uh, client-side frameworks. Uh, great. Let's see. Can we mix DevExpress MVC with DevExpress Web Forms in one solution? Absolutely. The, the beauty with the, the whole MVC Web Forms approach is you can mix and match. And I was saying before, if you're wanting to move to the MVC framework, then it's a great place just to start implementing new pages using it. And you can mix and match both of those technologies. Paul, are you, is it possible to get the webinar materials, slideshow, projects, etc.? That's a good question. I'm happy to make the projects available. As far as the, the slides and things, that are avail that's going to be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, the two projects were both vanilla projects. I'm more than happy to put them on a blog post later on today. Um, from Mark, we build most of our DevExpress controls dynamically. How much similarity is there between MVC and ASP controls? Um, what you need to remember is that what gets rendered out to the browser is pure HTML. So it really comes down to what you're building when you say build them dynamically. What you're doing with them is your current model event driven, in which case Again, we're not talking about an event-driven model. Um, more than happy to take a look at a couple of samples with you offline with that one. Um, let's see. The, the, the team is answering these faster than I can. Uh, Sam, any chance, uh, from Jean-Philippe, any chance DevExpress would have some sort of components that would reside on an MVC web page and can communicate in real time with an NT service residing on the same machine? Best thing to do with, with that question would be throw an example up in our support center um, because I know that uh, the guys looking after that sort of stuff would be the best suited to answer that of that technical nature. Uh, it looks like they replied try signal R for that. That's the, that's the first thing that jumps to mind, but if, yeah, if there's anything specific, um, we should point out the support center, which you get support during trial periods, but the guys are just renowned for the response time, they're renowned for the quality of the answers and how much help they provide. So if you've got any questions of the technical nature like that after this session, 
go to devexpress.com and click on support. All right. Looks like that is all of the questions. I'm going to steal the show, Amanda, and let everybody know what exciting things are happening next week. All right. <laughs> um, we're getting ready for our 14.2 release, which is just going to be an absolute amazing amount of extra features across all our platforms. And I know that all the guys have been busy on blog posts, uh, giving a bit of a preview as to some of the things that's coming out. And starting on Monday next week, we have a whole week of presentations in what's new. So if you haven't already, please head over to devexpress.com slash webinars and get yourself registered for each or all of the technologies that you're interested in. It's going to be an absolute amazing week of showing you what is in that release. Uh, we did have a couple of other questions that came in since we have a minute left. Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, we use WinForms in our projects with an XML model to create an interface like XAF. Can we do the same thing in MVC with your controls? Do you have any idea? Can you run that question again? Yes. We use WinForms in our projects with an XML model to create an interface like XAF. Could we do the same thing in MVC with DevExpress controls? Okay. So the question is, can you dynamically generate your interface in MVC? Given the fact that it's markup, um, that's happening from the server side, the short answer would be yes. I haven't tried it. Okay. Last question. Uh, let's see. Is it possible to apply custom binding for the records which come in the grid view header filter? Looking at the team, I'm going to say yes, but I just want them to validate my answer. <laughs> and they're all busy typing away to other things. But yeah. all, uh, it, a, the question is a little more vague. Uh, probably best if they uh, send the question to support um, in terms of like you know if you had a little more detail. But I mean yeah, I mean a couple of these questions you almost want to say yeah sure that's possible, but you know they may be thinking one thing. So that's a fair comment. All right, perfect. That's it. That's all the questions. Um, all right, everybody. So like Paul said, we do have um, all of our 14.2 webinar launch, uh, launch webinars posted, and you can register for them at devexpress.com slash webinars. They start on December 1st, next Monday, What's New in WinForms 14.2 uh, with Mr. Paul Usher and Julian Bucknell at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, December 2nd, Tuesday, What's New in ASP.NET WebForms and MVC. Uh, with Mool Harry, also at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. December 3rd, Reporting and Dashboards at 10 a.m. And HTML5 and Mobile at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time with Paul. And then December 4th, XAF. And December 5th is What's New in Code Rush 14.2 with Mr. Mark Miller at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Again, seating is limited for these 14.2 launch webinars, so register today for your spot. We also have um, you'll see on our webinars page several other upcoming webinars, uh, DevExpress, ASP.NET, Connecting Your Site to the Cloud, Responsive Web Design with DevExpress, and Making the Transition from Web Forms to ASP.NET MVC. Those are all coming up um, after launch and into 2015. All right. That's it for this one. Thank you to Paul. Thank you to the team. Thank you for joining us. And, of course, thank you for choosing DevExpress. Bye-bye.